welcome home. In this podcast, we venture into what it means to be a leader in this new world, human, flawed but working on things, and forever changed by using our intuition to guide us. I'm Adelina East, founder of Transformational Healing and mentor to those running soul-based businesses. Join me to receive transformational healing, tips to dive more deeply into your unique spiritual gifts, and to hear great conversations with other entrepreneurs in spirit. Let's get started. Hi, everybody. I'm Adelina East. I'm your host. I am an EMDR therapist. I use somatic experiencing internal family systems and my own modality to help people recover from trauma. In my modality, I use neuroscience and spirituality, and the combination is really powerful for people. For those of you that are new to the podcast, welcome. We do about every other week a deep meditation or a transformational healing solo episode on a topic of your suggestion. And every other week, we talk to a person who is doing incredible things in the world, therapists, woo practitioners other kinds of mental health and physical health experts, and those kinds of things. I'm so excited to be with you today because a few of you were reaching out to me and asking about recovering from abuse. This is something very dear to my heart. For those of you who've been listening to my work for a while, you may know that I have been in abusive relationships. Uh, I am a survivor of abuse, and I also witnessed them a lot growing up. I dedicated about a decade of my life to working with various NGOs to work with survivors of domestic violence. Sometimes it's called intimate partner violence. And so this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. I have a tendency to use EMDR, of course, and somatic experiencing and internal family systems all together when working with an abuse survivor, because I do think the combination of those things is really effective, but I also appreciate different kinds of approaches. So I know that in this particular country, I live in the U.S., I know that here in the U.S. we are having a shortage of therapists. We have many people in school trying to get ready to become therapists, but there is actually a shortage of licensed and certified therapists. And so sometimes other professions can fill in the gap of this kind of thing. At the moment, there are certain people who are training to become life coaches or who have already become life coaches to work with someone who can help them recover from this abuse, that can be effective for some people. For some people, it's not. However, today we are talking to a woman who is working with others in a more holistic way to help people recover from intimate partner violence or intimate partner abuse. Her name is Dr. Schaefer Stedron. She has been doing this work for the last couple of years. She actually is a trained neurologist and was working as a neurologist beforehand. She is also a musician. She's a Jay Jay Shetty certified life coach, author, and publisher. And she hosts a health and healing podcast called Talks with Dr. Schaefer. She's very passionate about helping people to reclaim their stories and create the next chapter of the life that they truly want. One of her projects right now revolves around a children's story. She's also writing another book. I'm going to let her tell you more about what's going on for her and the kind of work that she does with abuse survivors. Without any further ado, let's chat with Dr. Schaefer. Hey, everybody. I'm so happy to introduce our guest today. We have with us Dr. Schaefer Stedron. She is an incredible human being. You just heard all about her in the intro. And I'm excited to speak with her because we do very similar things. So for those of you that are new to the podcast, my background is in working with survivors of domestic violence. I worked with and trained with and dedicated over a decade of my year of life, years of life to working with survivors of domestic violence through working with different NGOs and the United Nations and that kind of thing. I loved doing that work. I found it to be so rewarding. And I do continue to work with survivors here in Albuquerque and Santa Fe, as well as online. So without any further ado, let's talk to Dr. Schaefer Stedren. Hey, Dr. Schaefer. 
Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. I was just asking Dr. Schaefer about her name because when I first found her and all of her amazingness, I found her as Dr. Schaefer Stedron, but I notice on her profile here, it says Stedronova. Can you tell us a little about that? Yes, absolutely. So I am happily remarried. Uh, my husband's last name is Stedron, okay. um, and it's a beautiful last name in Czech. It means generous. So I was I was super excited to take on this beautiful last name. I love the story behind it. And we were planning on getting married in Europe in Prague, and there mm -hmm. my name would be Stedronova. And so I had already done all of my branding, my website, everything based on the fact that we were very soon to be married and take on his, his last name. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, in my usual fashion, decided, no, we should elope to New York City. Mm -hmm. And it was so beautiful and fun. But even in New York City, uh, they do not honor those cultural differences in names. Oh, wow. So unfor yeah, I know. I was so surprised. That they is were surprising. They, I, I think they hear this all the time at the city clerk's office. They're like, I'm, we're so sorry. There's nothing we can do. So anyways, I became Stedron on my driver's license, but I like to pretend, you know, it's my, it's my super secret alias too. Okay. So. I love that. <laughs> I've been to Prague many times. It's beautiful. Oh, well, next time you're there, let me know. Okay. So Dr. Schaefer, tell us a little bit about your journey and how you came to work with survivors. Yeah. So, you know, I myself was in a very difficult, very long relationship that was something that I really need to disentangle from. And I started to recognize that over time. And I was really stuck in a bit of a victim mode. I was feeling so disempowered and very gradually over my life, my personal life, my professional life, my control within my family of my own autonomy, even in my own home, I was just feeling like I had less and less control over my life. And when you're in that disempowered state, you just start to feel hopeless. Mm -hmm. And so even though I had trained as a physician and, you know, I had all of this power that had been kind of hidden away in me, I couldn't access it until my best friend actually realized what state I was in, realized what was going on, reached out to me and asked me, do you know that you matter? Mm -hmm. And I know, and it was really the first time I think anyone in my life had ever asked me that question or made me feel that I did. Mm -hmm. So that really just shook my soul. And I had to do a lot of thinking about what that meant for me. I came to the a realization that yes, I did matter and that I not only mattered for myself, but for my kids yeah. and that for them to feel their sense of worth, they needed to see me step into mine. Right, right. And, and regain my autonomy. So I started to do the really difficult work of regaining my strength. Um, and I think a part of why I do what I do, um, working with other people who have been in a similar situation as myself and creating the podcast and other content that's very supportive and trying to help people is that podcasts and that type of media really saved my life in that moment in time. You know, for me, listening to Les Carter, who's a therapist, a psychologist, he's he's based in Texas, and he has a wonderful series on dealing with controlling people. And in talking about controlling people, which I think is a big issue for many of us who end up in that state, right? We are, yeah. we are delegating away our right. autonomy and our control. He really did a great job of Yes, at first, focusing on the story, focusing on what's happening to you, but then kind of sneakily getting back to the part and what are we going to do about it? Right. Right. Yeah. And that's when I really started to recognize I'm not in a cage. I'd felt like I'd been in a cage for a long time. And I recognized I'm not in a cage. I'm running on a hamster wheel. I'm running. I'm running. Mm -hmm. I can either keep on running and get nowhere or I can step off. Right. And that's what, that's what I chose to do. And when I did that and went through that really, really messy process of reclaiming my life and rebuilding my sense of self-worth, changing my mindset, changing the monologue that was going on in my head, changing how I responded to things. As I did that, you know, 
for my privacy and my safety. I changed my number several times. I really was barely leaving my home. I was living a very isolated life when I was trying to break out of that initial isolation. And what was happening was people were somehow getting my phone number and getting my new email. And I was receiving messages regularly from women saying, listen, I'm so sorry to bother you. So-and-so, maybe someone I knew or someone I didn't even know in the community gave me your information. And they said, you could help me. I have this problem. I'm leaving this relationship and I need help. Can you give me some resources? Can you give me support? And so that was just happening naturally. Right. And as that happened, I realized, okay, so I'm feeling really stuck. I'm feeling really hopeless and worthless, but yet other people are seeing me on my journey and it's inspiring them Mm -hmm. and it's helping them. So how can I make this my mission? How can I make this into a path that I can go along? Because it just felt so right. And that's when I came upon life coaching. Okay. And I became, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And so after you came upon life coaching, did you have a life coach that helped you get out of your abusive situation? Yeah. So, you know, I didn't even have any access to funds. I did not have funds for a life coach. I took everything I had and I actually worked towards my certification. So I became a Jay Shetty certified life coach. Mm -hmm. Um, And on that journey, as you're learning how to be a life coach, you're having an opportunity to work with one another and to work with people who have already graduated from the program that are doing further certifications, or they're just giving back to the community. And so within that program, I did receive a lot of life coaching and I gave a lot of life coaching. And it was such a transformative experience. So incredible. If it's something that is tapping on you, you know, tapping on your soul, like, oh, I think, I think I want to do this. I would highly recommend, you know, looking into that program because it, it really was transformative for me. And as I was going through this journey on this learning journey, learning a new way of thinking mindset, how to coach and communicate and help support others on that journey, I'm a very um, verbal processing person. Mm -hmm. And so I started to create reels and I would feel really fearful sometimes if they were quite vulnerable to share them. And I found over time, oh, no, when I'm feeling a little triggered, when I'm feeling a little triggered and fearful, that's actually something I need to lean into instead of back away from. So I would share those reels and the response I would get in comments and in direct messages was so affirming Mm -hmm. that people needed to hear someone else voice these things. Maybe they weren't in a place where they could do that, but it really helped them to be able to do that. And so that led me on the path to creating uh, more and more content, creating my website, We Don't Tell Our Stories, which is a place, a community that I've created to try to use music and literature and podcasts and all sort of excuse me, all sort of reflective and supportive content to help people who are on this journey dealing with intimate partner violence, domestic abuse, to meet them where they are with a medium that can just sit beside them. So that reflected on that project as well as also eventually me making similar. I was listening to your podcast and how you have your more meditative episodes. I started also with solo episodes that were really kind of just trying to hug someone with affirmations through the airwaves. Um, And then that really naturally grew into having guests on the show as well. And I am just so thrilled by the experiences I'm having with my listeners and with guests of just connecting and storytelling. And it just really pushes me along on my mission to help people reclaim their stories. Because every time you hear someone's story, you share their story, you share their growth, their journey of growth from that story, it just has this domino effect on anyone around. And then it gives them just that little data point of like, okay, they did this. They had these challenges. They felt the way I feel. Yeah. And yet they they leaned into it and they succeeded. And maybe mm-hmm. I could too. Just plant that seed of hope. 
Yeah. And I think it's really one thing that you said that I attach to is meeting people where they are. So I think that in the world of self-help, whether it's through therapy or life coaching or anything that people try, I think the most important part is to meet people where they are. And so being that it's a more, I'm going to say recent experience for you, though I know not super recent, but still, you know, within the last five years, let's say, it's still a fairly recent experience for you. You are able to talk to people about it in a way that is different than I can. It was many years ago for me. So I tend to work more with people who also had this happen to them many years ago, whereas you tend to work with people where it's more fresh. And I think that's something that's so, so important when people are seeking out help is to find the person that is right for them at that exact time. And often our intuition is the only thing that we have to guide us. So as people are listening to this podcast, if they're wondering, you know, what is the next step? Think about where you want to go and think about the person that you feel the most comfortable sharing your story with, because there is a lot of healing in sharing that story. I'll get into EMDR at some point about how we don't want to share our story over and over and over again, because it deepens the neural grooves, the neural pathways that traumatize us and keep us kind of stuck. But I do think that there is a point in the healing journey where you are able to, you've already done all of the work to, to reroute those neural pathways so that you can just speak about it without having that same charge. Yes. Will you talk to us a little bit about how you got there as a survivor? You know, you can't skip the messy middle, Mm -hmm. right? True. And when you're in that kind of ooey gooey, you haven't scabbed over stage, it's really easy to get stuck in the story. Yes. Right? And I think the thing that can really cement you is a feeling of hopelessness Mm -hmm. and the thing that can really propel you forward is choosing an environment that will facilitate your growth. Yes. And that involves extricating yourself from the people or places that are leading to your wilting, right? To your dying on the vine, right? Yeah. You can't grow in that place. You mm-hmm. can't grow with people who are committed to you being that person that no longer is who you are anymore. Right. So you have to make those tough decisions. And when you make those tough decisions, you have to work on yourself. And when you choose to share your story, I am of the mindset that you have to be very careful with who and how you share that story Mm -hmm. because you can certainly be re-traumatized. You can end up if you feel that you have to explain yourself to this person, if you feel that their response is similar to the response that you would have gotten back in that abusive relationship you were in, that can just set you so far back because like you said, go into that groove and we're stuck again. We're back in that Mm -hmm. hamster wheel and now we have to step off of it again. And so I think part of it is one, really healing yourself to the point that when you share your story, you're not really looking for someone to affirm it. Right. It's lovely if they acknowledge it and hear you, but yeah. they don't have to agree with you. Right. Right. They, you just want them to listen. Mm-hmm. And if you're looking for a specific kind of support, listen and give that support. Obviously, mm-hmm. if it's a therapist or a life coach. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point, too it's okay to ask for the kind of support you need. You need. Yeah. Yeah. Like people can't read your mind. Mm -hmm. They can't. And so I think it's okay with someone you trust and care about to say, to start the conversation off with, Hey, listen, I need to share this. I may be all in the wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't want advice. I really just need someone to sit with me and hear me out for five minutes, for 10 minutes, and then we can move on and talk about anything else, Yeah, right? And that just sets you up. If they're willing to go on that journey 
for you that sets you up to be heard in a safe way. And it also tells them, okay, if I have a really bad day, mm-hmm. you know, maybe I have, I know someone who understands the impact of listening and I know who I can turn to. So, you know, don't be embarrassed to ask for that because we mm-hmm. all need that. And when you show yeah. up in that vulnerable way, what a blessing to that person to be able to show up for you like that. And now they also may reach to you, which we love. We love being needed. We love being a safe place for others. So I think it's such a great opportunity for true connection. I am so delighted to share with you that I am opening back up my multidimensional mentorship program. We have seen graduates go on to start their own businesses with their intuitive gifts, such as channeling, healing, tarot card reading, astrology, human design, chef, also so many other beautiful professions that are healing the world and making it into the better place where we all want to be. If you are struggling, if you're trying to figure out what your life purpose is, check out my multidimensional mentorship program. I am so excited to work with people who are ready for change, who are ready to dive into their intuitive gifts and see exactly what they're ready to do here on this planet at this time. We will put the link below and I look forward to hearing from you. Let's switch gears a little. So you were formerly a neurologist. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm still a neurologist. You are still a neurologist. Seeing, yeah. Yes. I'm Just not, not practicing at the moment. Exactly. I'm not seeing patients currently. No, yeah. but yes, I'm a board certified adult neurologist. Can you... Talk to us a little bit about the neurology of abuse. We started talking about this before we started recording. And I just, I think it's so useful for our listeners to know. Yeah, we were, you know, kind of contemplating, well, how, how do we talk about the neurology of abuse? Because it's such a, a broad topic. Yeah. And when you meet someone, I think it's interesting too, when you meet someone and they have abusive tendencies, like where, where did that come from? Mm-hmm. Right. Is that just who they are or did they have certain things that they experienced that were modeled in childhood that set in their mind certain neural pathways, right? right? Mm -hmm. That led to disinhibition of the higher cortical processes that would say, no, we don't act like that, right? If they themselves were exposed to domestic violence, then those inhibitory pathways and those really more reflective pathways are wilting. They're less strong over time and the more primal or reactive reflexive, you know, just kind of quick responses Mm -hmm. that are in the very primal old parts of our brain. They're the ones that are going to respond. Right. So that's why it's such a big topic because there's that history there, this person has some sort of history, their brain works the way it works. Mm -hmm. And then they're interacting with another person who has their history and their brain chemistry, their, you know, potential genetic or environmental predispositions to how they're going to show up and what they're going to expect for themselves in that relationship. And sometimes it's this recipe for abuse and violence. And the thing that we were discussing is, you know, so if we're in that groove and we're constantly responding or we're constantly in a state of chronic stress Mm -hmm. because our home life or our work life, a relationship has led us to expect a negative response, even if it's one time out of a hundred, if it's been reinforced over time, if we're always watching out for that and having this fearful response, those higher level processes, those are, those are offline, Mm -hmm. right? Once the Wi-Fi is out, the Wi-Fi is out, (laughs) you know, it's very sensitive. Yes. The eloquent and amazing, the prefrontal cortex, you know, it's a third of our brain. It's the higher emotional part of our brain that when it's in charge, it's it's our supercomputer. It's amazing. Yeah, it's true. But when it's offline, it's off. It's off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we're just in those primal responses that are there because if we're out at night and there's a tiger, we need to run away from it exactly. to survive. The yeah. tiger's not here anymore for most of us, but our relationship may be the tiger. Right. Right. 
And that's and, part yeah. of what makes it so hard to run is if you go home to the tiger every single night, mm. you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Maybe the and loving tiger, maybe exactly. the abusive tiger. Who knows? Exactly. Exactly. Because they're not, it's not like they're the same way all the time. Exactly. And none that's, of us are, but exactly, you know, some of us are, we, we don't have abuse. We don't exact abuse on others. Right. So right. I'm sorry, go ahead. What were you about to say? No. So I think, and, and so you go home, like you said, to the tiger every night, right? And uh -huh. you're kind of, there's that term walking on eggshells, right? Cause you're just, mm -hmm. you're just a hair trigger away from, you know, something that you've discussed recently in one of your um, episodes about CPTSD, you know, your fawn, your flight, your fight response, you're just a hair trigger away from that. Yeah. Right. The problem is you can't change in that environment. You can't shock yourself out of that yeah. and get that prefrontal. You can't get the Wi-Fi back on board. You can't get the mm -hmm. prefrontal cortex back in charge of yourself and your mind when your body is telling you, no, I'm afraid. And it's really interesting because I think when you're in that situation, you wish, I wish I should, could just feel better. Yeah. Can I just deal with this? Why am I so dysregulated? Yeah. But the reality is your nervous system says, nope, hard stop. I am going to keep sending this signal until we're safe because at the end of the day, that's all I care about. It's like when you faint, right? When you, right. When, when you don't have blood flow to your brain, your brain is in charge. So if your brain senses that it's in danger, you will faint. And it doesn't really care if you knock out your teeth or you break your nose or your arm. Yeah. Your brain doesn't care. It's going to make you actually pass out and lay flat on the ground if it senses a certain amount of it's not getting enough blood flow. It's, you know, your heart rate's not correct. It's going to lay you down if you don't lay yourself down mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, it's in crisis mode. It doesn't care right. that, you know, you don't want to break your nose. It doesn't care you don't want to break your arm. This is a crisis. And right. I think as much as it bothers us when we're in that state of dysregulation, it also saves us because it's not going to go away until you change your environment. Right. And in talking about changing our environment, it's not, you know, you, we were talking about this before we started recording today. It's not just about leaving your spouse or your intimate partner. It's also about changing the entire environment. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's about leaving the situation, circumstance, or person that is putting you in that in that fight or flight neurochemical milieu, right? You right. have to change that. But when you go, this is going to go with you. Right. And this has been retrained to be chronically stressed. Yeah. Right. And so you need to strengthen. It's not a muscle. Obviously, our, our brain is not a muscle, but we we like to liken it to that uh, when we talk about growing our mindset, growing uh, new belief systems, really getting back to self-alignment and our values, because that makes sense to people, right? We say, right. well, if I want to be stronger, I'm going to do reps, wow. right? Yes. I, I don't expect my bicep to get nice and bulky if I don't use it. Mm -hmm. But I think because of the shame in our culture and this feeling of unworthiness, I never do anything right. I'm just not enough. We don't necessarily recognize that for me to get where I want to go, I have to exercise that. I have to exercise mindfulness. I have to exercise my self-worth. I have to really commit to that, make it a new habit make it a new neural circuitry. So instead of staying down and this kind of lower functioning part of my brain that's there to keep me safe from the tiger, we're going up, you know, we're right. emotionally regulated. We are reflective, not reactive. Right. And getting to emotional regulation is so challenging when coming out of a long-term fight or flight situation. Yeah. I was just chatting about this with a client the other day. When you've been living with a, a person or working for a person for many years who is abusive, you really don't do go into that upregulated nervous system state where you're in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And 
what I've noticed over the years with my clients is that as they start to try to get out of that, there are some starts and stops. So, you know, you may read an article about meditation and start trying to meditate two or three times a day, and that might help. But the moment you're out of meditation, you're back into flight, fight, freeze, or fall. Yeah. Yeah. And so it really is about taking care of yourself during that time and understanding that it won't happen overnight for everybody. For some people it will, and that's beautiful. But if you have to meditate three times a day for the next couple of years to get out of that dysregulated state, that's okay. You're doing your thing. There are other practices that you can incorporate too, and maybe it will help the journey be less long. But a major part of it is self-acceptance and accepting where you are in your journey and knowing that you will get to that point of nervous system regulation. It will happen. Yes, you will. And through meditation, EMDR, I mean, you can find little tricks to use in a crisis, right? Mm -hmm. You may have to have a little trick that you use when you're at work. Um, let's say you do public speaking for work and you have this trigger that can sometimes send your nervous system awry and you don't want it to happen right before you go on stage. So you might have to come up with little, little tricks, you know, for me, um, when I would get, you know, threatening messages and it got to the point where just that little ding, yeah, ding would just, just, just adrenaline surge. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the natural response to that, if you can't cut that off, right? If you can't cut it off before the secretion, you're going to be dealing with those effects for at least 20 minutes to a few hours. Like like we right. said, with everything, it takes its own time. It you does. cannot just cut it off. But if you can find little tricks to, if I know a stimulus is coming, I know a little trick that can help. And, and my little nervous system trick that I take to try to just completely redirect where my mind is going in response to a negative stimulus is what I did was I just laughed because honestly they were laughable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that, that degree of reaction to them on my part was now from the perspective I have now was laughable. It wasn't laughable at the time because I had not gotten to the point where I could really sift through real threat versus perceived threat, right? Mm -hmm. Something that could really harm me versus I'm going to give you the stimulus because I want a response from you. Right. But the stimulus, you know, it's like, it's like in, um, in a haunted house, right? It's not yes. real. It's yes. not a real ghost. And so before I could figure out what was a real threat and what was just a pretend ghost in a haunted house, I had to trick my nervous system. I had to fake it till I could make it. And so yeah. for me to try to just not constantly have that flooding because mm-hmm. I was receiving these very commonly, very often oh. uh, to try to, you know, kind of keep you in that, you yes, know, uh, abuse that is control. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Abuse mm-hmm. is control by another name. And so just kind of keep your attention and, and keep your focus, keep you dysregulated. That was happening quite quickly or quite frequently rather. And I just, I just decided to take back the reins. And so I would mm-hmm guffaw laugh. I mean, it had to be theatrical for it okay. to work. <laughs> All right. It's like, haha, half-hearted, you know, I had to yeah. really trick my nervous system. Like, no, this is funny. Okay. And within days or a week, I believed it. Good. And That's it was wonderful. true. Yeah, it was true. It really was. It really was funny. 99% of the time they weren't real. They yeah. were, they were just you know, just a funny thing. And so that was a little trick that I did. Um, It's not necessarily like a neurological hack, but I think, you know, when you hack your nervous system, that that's powerful. Um, Mm -hmm. So I like to share that just because, you know, I think it's okay to, to trick yourself a little bit when you're in that messy middle part so that you can stay regulated. So then you can maintain your energy. You're not dysregulated and then you can do the meditation. You can listen to the podcast. You can read the article. You can listen Mm -hmm. to a conversation like this and you can be present for it because if you're constantly dysregulated, if you're constantly in that lower emotional state, again, like we said, you've got to change the environment, right? And if, if the person or thing that led to your discomfort or being unsafe still has access to you, 
you have to find a way. You have to commit Mm -hmm. to find a way to regulate your nervous system, as you were saying earlier, because it's it's the only path forward to healing and and to becoming who you want to be and leaving behind the narrative of who the person who's abusing you wants you to fit into. Exactly. Could not have said it better myself. That was beautiful. I would love to read a book written by you at some point, but I understand that you have two small children, so that might not be coming for a while. It's in the works. I actually have a children's book um, that I'm just waiting for my illustrations to be absolutely perfect. I'm really excited. I'm working with a wonderful illustrator. Um, And so that actually is a book about a little neurodivergent boy who is dysregulated just based on his age and his environment, right? He's just going through those normal little dysregulating moments in his day. And his Mm -hmm. mom has gone through that process of healing herself. Yeah of sitting with her inner child and kind of letting it be what it's going to be. And so now she knows how to sit with him. Okay. And as the day goes on, he's dysregulated over and over and over again. And unhealed mom might've said, oh, this isn't working. I'm, you know, it's time to send him, even though he's way too young for it to be, you know, developmentally appropriate, I'll send him to his room or I'll take his toys away or I'll do this or that, the other thing. Mm -hmm. But because mom is in a state of regulation, she continues to gift him her calm. And then at the end of the day, something really bad happens. The title of the book is The Boy and His Brightly Colored Blocks. His okay. brightly colored block masterpiece is broken. Oh, and no. I know, worst thing that could happen the whole day. But because <laughs> all day he's been gifted her calm and gifted her reassurance, he says, it's okay, mom. I can just do it better. And in that moment, mom also is given that gift of like, okay, you know, that thing that we want as parents and we often don't receive like, okay, I'm Mm -hmm. doing the right thing. Stick with it. Stick with the regulation. Stick with what you believe to be the growth oriented way of parenting and making sure your child feels safe with you because you're, you're on the right path. So that's a book that is almost in print. And then I will be also publishing We Don't Tell Our Stories, which is a book about intimate partner abuse. Okay. We will look forward to those. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Schaefer. We really appreciate you. And I look forward to seeing your podcast and listening to all of your wisdom in future. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a lovely conversation. And I hope to have you as a guest on my podcast as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to these important conversations about cosmic leadership and the changing needs of our times. If you enjoyed this conversation, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also share it with a friend. Join our crew at Adelina East on Instagram or at Adelina East Healing on Facebook. With all the love from every dimension, Adelina. Adelina.